The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm your host, Jordan Roberts. We have some special guests today. We've got Adam Smith. He works for Autodesk. He's awesome. We've got Wayne Griffenberg, who you guys know. We hang out every week. Today, we're going to talk about a free technology that's included inside the software called Adaptive Clearing. Adam's got a really great presentation. He's going to go into the technology, give us an overview. Wayne is there to show us how to use this technology to improve the profitability of our business. And as always, we have a live Q&A session as well. So as we're going over content, please feel free to tell us who you are, what you're doing, what you're struggling with. We record those questions and we've got AEs standing by to answer those direct, but then everything that we don't get a hold of today, we follow up with you the following week. And you know, as always, if you're finding value in these weekly HSM Hangouts, tell us how we can improve, tell a friend, uh, share the wealth. So before we get running, uh, a couple quick housekeeping items. I want to do a quick poll here. Uh, as always, we always like to understand the kinds of CNC machines you're running. So get your votes in, guys. Uh, this is a democracy, as always. Your vote counts at Autodesk, so please vote away. Adam, any guesses? The question is, what kind of brand CNC machines are you currently running? Any guesses as to who's going to win uh, this poll today? We got 80% polled. That's a great question, Jordan. Interested to see the results on that. So, looking at the results, you know, our our winner, as always, has been Haas. I think Haas has had the winning vote for the last four weeks running, so that's awesome. We're going to ask a couple more questions here. You know, I'm always curious to understand how long everyone's been using the software. Um, you know, the whole purpose of these Friday Hangouts is to help people understand and adopt the software. So I want to understand how long you guys have been using Autodesk HSM products. So brand new, uh, you know, are you already a customer? Do you use this as a training tool? That's really what we've got this whole session set up for. Um, so here, let's close. Thanks for the votes, guys. Awesome. So Adam, Wayne, great distribution this week. 25% uh, brand new, 43% have been engaged for a few months, and then 32% of the crowd today has actually been with us for longer than six months. So that is awesome. Thank you for coming back, guys. I love seeing the, the repeat customers and familiar names on our list. That's awesome. You know, for those of you that maybe aren't using our software every day, we want to understand what other CAD CAM software you might be using. So please let us know. Get your votes in. The polls are almost done, so the faster we get the votes in, the faster we move on to the presentation from Adam and the demo from Wayne. Awesome, guys. Thanks so much. We're at 60% voted, rapidly climbing 70. Let's get it to 80. 80% closing the poll. Interesting here. Uh, HSM has the majority, 47%. Love seeing that. That's awesome. Thanks, guys. That's huge for us. So um, here, let's do a couple more quick questions here. Again, what industries do you guys serve? Let us know. If you don't see an industry that you know is represented here and you want us to focus in on that, um, please shout it out in the chat. We'll get some industry-specific content to you, and we'll add it to the webinars down the road. We've got the next 10 weeks scheduled. Great. So yeah, for the 76% of you that said other, please let us know what that is and some things that are specific to your industry. We'll make sure to get that uploaded on the calendar. And then, let's see. So I guess here's one or my final question before I kick it over to Adam. I want to understand how many of you have tried adaptive clearing. Um, you know, does it scare you? You've never heard of it. Yes, you've tried it. Um, you know. Absolutely. I love the smell of chips blasting in the morning. It'll let us know. Tell us what you're thinking. Wow. Adam, any thoughts as to what the distribution might be on this one? No. You know, I, I'm really curious because this is always a, you know, that's why we're here today to present this topic. It's always a very touchy subject and, 
and and uh, you know basically these answers are a lot of what we hear in the industry, but more towards the you know first couple uh, first two or three answers. So I'm really curious to see what the feedback is. Awesome, great, Adam. A little hard to hear you just then, but we got we got the core message. Um, we're going to share the results. Wow, look at us, 65% of wow. you didn't even, didn't even know about it. I mean, yeah. maybe, maybe we need to email the marketing team and let them know, you know, get the information into the hands of the people. And with that, that's all the polling, Adam. Uh, passing it back over to you. Uh, take it away. I'm excited to see what you have for us today. All right, fantastic. Hey, Jordan, can you, can you guys see my screen? It looks great. You've got some, some really nice chips there. Nice, perfect. All right, cool. Thanks, Jordan. Appreciate the uh, you know the introduction. Uh, thanks everyone for joining the webinar today. My name is Adam Smith, I'm sales manager for HSM, and you know want to talk about a great topic today. And it's really interesting to see those results where you know 65% of you have not even used this technology yet, and that's why we want to host these webinars because we want to make sure that you understand the technology that's delivered inside of our products, and so. We always love to start with this slide. I know you know the guys may have covered this in previous presentations, but if you're not familiar with Pier 9, you know we have this fantastic facility out in San Francisco. So you guys may think of us as the AutoCAD group, or you know, hey, you guys have always been well known for CAD design. Well, you should know that we have a phenomenal manufacturing facility out in Pier 9 in San Francisco. So this is the front. I love this slide. You know, we got a couple of Haas machines. We got a five-axis wood router. We have laser cutters. We have water jet machines. Um, you know, if you think of the coolest and most badass machine shop there is, this is kind of it, right? You've got CNC machines. You've got 3D printers. You got welders. You got a paint booth. You got a manual machine shop, woodworking, right? So all of Autodesk has access to this facility. Um, and what we use this for is testing out our technology, advancing the products, right? Anytime we come out with a new feature or function, we have the ability to test it firsthand. You know, we don't need to rely on sending it to industry and say, oh, hey, can you give us feedback, right? We can test it ourselves. Um, so down at the bottom, you'll notice we have uh, different pictures of, you know, our, our, our residents working at this facility. And what we do is we hire what's called resident, uh, artists in residence. And they come in and use this facility 24-7, um, and they get to build whatever they want, right? It is kind of like, you know, the world is yours. Do what, um, you know, do what you want to use, right? Let me see. I flip my screen. Is that better? Do I have the right screen up now? That's perfect, Eric. Oh, Adam. Yep. Sorry. All right, so, um, so you see it down at the bottom. They have access to this facility to make whatever they want. In the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see they made a conference room table that actually hangs from the ceiling. Okay? Uh, it is a, it is a one-and-a-half-inch thick steel plate as the top of the table. It's steel other than the wood seats that you sit in. Right? So we always look at how we can manufacture things in the future, technology that we can develop, and we use these artists to, um, when they create these, they generate instructions on instructables, and you can figure out and, and find how they're designing and manufacturing these products. So if you're ever in San Francisco, let Jordan, let myself, let Wayne know. We'd love to give you a tour of this facility. We're also building another facility in downtown Boston in the shipbuilding district. Same type of uh, facility. It's going to be two stories. We've got you know CNC machines. We've got a UMC 750 going in there from Haas. Um, we've got robots. We're going to do carbon fiber laying. It's going to be a really fantastic facility. Uh, again, if you're in Boston, check it out. Take a tour of it. All right. So <clears throat> what we're here to take, talk today about is our adaptive clearing. And this technology is in all of our CAM solutions today at Autodesk. So we have HSM Works, which is a plugin for SolidWorks. Adaptive clearing is in Inventor HSM and Infusion. And the great thing about this is we develop one technology, one core algorithm, and we just plug it into three different systems. Okay, so the technology in CN SolidWorks is the same in Inventor and Infusion. And so I got a video here. I'll play it and 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 let me know the feedback on it and see. I I just want to see if you're getting a good image of this.
So, Jordan, if, how is the how is the video playback on that? Was it good or was it a bit choppy? Hey Adam, this is Wayne. It was a little bit choppy, but not too bad. Okay. We saw some coal in flying, a couple chips flying. It's not uh, wasn't okay. too bad, but not as smooth as it could be. Yeah, I got a couple other videos, so I just wanted to check that, and maybe we'll just skip those videos. But what I wanted to show you there is that's a video of us testing at Pier 9. And the holder we're using is what's called a spike tool holder. And what we do is when we, when we test this technology out, we can figure out, you know, how we're controlling our tools, if we're over-engaging, and we can get great feedback uh, about how we're developing this tool path. And we'll talk about it later uh, in the presentation. But I want to show you that's something that we've done uh, in-house at our Pier 9 facility. So what we want to talk about now is what is high-efficiency roughing? You know, what is adaptive clearing? What does it mean? And how is it different than what I'm used to doing? So if you look on the left-hand image here, this is how we traditionally rough a pocket, okay? And how we calculate that tool path in HSM is pretty simple, right? We take the outside boundary of what we're going to machine, we tell it what tool we're using, what step over we're using, and then the tool path will automatically just start stepping in from the outside geometry, okay? Very inefficient, very ineffective, um, but that's how we've always done it, okay? Now, if we look at the right-hand side, you say, wow, that is, you know, something that looks terrible. Uh, wow, you, you know, my tool path is now probably like 10 times longer and, you know, making much more moves than what I'm used to doing. How can that be more effective and efficient? Well, the way this thing works is, you know, here let's watch what a traditional tool path looks like cutting. Okay? So as we're going through this tool path, you're, you're noticing, look right there, my tool is fully engaging 180 degrees of the tool and the material, right? So this is the worst machining scenario we get when roughing a pocket, right? That's when you hear the tool chirping, your tool heats up, it starts deflecting, over-engages, and it breaks the tool, right? That's when you got to hit the feed rate override, slow it down because you know it's going in a corner, okay? So that's how we've always done it. Now we're going to watch this video on the right. And notice how we have this fluid motion. Our tool is constantly moving in circular interpolation moves, right? And that tool never engages more than what I tell it to, right? So if I say, you know what, I, this is a half-inch end mill and I want to step over 100 thousandths, right? It'll never over-exceed that, okay? And that's what high efficiency is. It's keeping the tool constantly engaged at a designated uh, engagement angle and creates this tool path. Okay, so here's another image, you know, if, as we're walking our tool down on the left-hand side, you know, we notice we got a little bit less than 90 degrees of our tool engaged. Let's say it's, you know, 80, 85, 80 degrees of our tool, and we're walking down, and what happens when we get into a corner, right? My tool fully engages, and I overcut, right? My chip thickness changes, you have loud chirping noises again, right, and then it goes back to 80, 85 degrees engagement. But on the right-hand side, with high efficiency roughing and adaptive clearing, we control how much the tool is engaged in the material. And we, never, and we tell it, don't ever exceed this. If I tell you I want 85 degrees of my tool engaged, never go over that, right? And that's how the toolpath algorithm works. So <clears throat> this is a great diagram of what your tool will look like and where you're going to load your tool, right? So, you know, we've always rough pockets. We take light depth of cuts, you know, and we're only using 100, maybe 200 thousandths of the tip of the tool, right? And you have, you know, you have one inch of flute length right there, you know? So you're wasting the rest of that tool because you can rough with this, but you couldn't go back and finish with this tool because then it would leave a little witness mark where you've been roughing out your whole pocket with, right? So. If we look at the next diagram, what I tell customers is use the entire tool. They put that much flute length on your tool for a reason, right? Use it all up. So when I tell customers when they're first getting into adaptive clearing and, and this constant engagement tool path, you say, you know, where do you start? And I say bury the tool, right? Go as deep as you can. And then we take lighter step over, but we're going to go full depth of cut. Okay, so the biggest question that we hear in the industry is how do you calculate speeds and feeds, right? 
and it's a very challenging, uh, you know, it could be very challenging to do for some people. Um, here's another video, I'm going to skip over that, but <clears throat> um, when we're calculating tool path, um, tooling vendors have great speeds and feeds calculators based on their tooling, okay? But you have to remember that everyone's manufacturing processes are different, right? And so what we do when you when you start talking to your tooling vendors, they've kept recalculated, you know, new calculators that are for tool paths of constant cutter engagement or tool engagement angles, right? And so this is a, this slide here just shows you if I'm using this tool and I'm engaging uh, 164 thousandths of my tool, I've got 70 degrees of my tool engaged in the material at any time, right? So when you hear like TEA over optimal load, you know, we'd use optimal load. Uh, in a traditional tool path by whatever my step over is, right? But we control it by that angle and we never exceed what that angle is um, in the material. So the way that we calculate speeds and feeds in the video, uh, we'll make sure this, this uh, presentation is available for all of you um, after this webinar. So you can actually watch the videos better and you can fast forward them, slow them down. But the one that we skipped over shows a great explanation of how we calculate speeds and feeds. So what I've always tell customers is, look, I can, I can tell you what I've done in the past. I can tell you what I've done on certain machines at certain shops. But here's the thing. You're going to be using different holders than I would use. Or your machine may be a little bit older. Or, you know, there, there's just so many scenarios in manufacturing and roughing that, you know, it's really hard to come up with. I can just give you an exact number and you can run with it. Okay, so the best thing that we do is we do what's called straight line test cuts. Throw a block of material in your machine and do a test cut. Right, so what you want to do is um, you can just MDI a program, you can throw it in HSM, but do a straight line test cut and start with, you know, talk to your tooling vendor. Say, hey, uh, I'm running in 6061 or I'm running in 1018 or, or D3 or, you know, whatever, you know, D2 material, it's hard and it's heat treated, yeah, you know, uh, it's cold roll steel, right, titanium, Inconel. And they'll say, okay, with that tool, you'll run, you know, this, um, you know, chip thickness. And so you test it out, right? Test your holders out. You want to use shrink, you know, some people use shrink fit holders because the tool holds better uh, in a shrink fit than in the R32 collet or a, a weld and shank. Like I said, there's so many scenarios that can uh, affect the process of roughing out material. So the best way to do it, throw, your, throw a piece of material in it, start straight line test cutting. And I'm kind of old school. Um, yeah, I'm not really good at calculating speeds and feeds, so I just throw it in there and I just I just start running the tool until it breaks, and then I back it off 20%. Right? May not be the most effective way to do it, but that's how I know I can get as aggressive as I can with that tool, with that setup, and in that process. So when I do these straight line test cuts, I then take that data. Right? I say, okay, I'm going to run at 10,000 RPMs. I'm running at you know, one inch depth of cut, and I'm running at uh, you know, an engagement of like 20, 000, uh, 20 degree engagement. I then take those numbers, plug it into HSM, generate the tool path, plug and play. Because if you look at this, this right image over here, if you look at that image, it's basically like machining in a straight line. Okay, when, when we're doing adaptive clearing, it's basically machining in a straight line. So if I can prove that out in an application where I'm doing straight line test cuts, I know I can take that data, plug it right in to HSM, and create my tool path. Okay, so <clears throat> overcoming the depth. So one of the biggest issues we have is we're not used to cutting so deep, right? So again, we, we're taking half inch end mills, one inch deep, inch and a half deep, you know, two inches deep in some scenarios. Taking three eighths end mills, one inch deep. Well, the problem that you're going to find is you're not used to getting down to that depth. Okay, so how do you get to that depth of cut? And here's a great example of how the industry is changing their tooling to accept, you know, these great depths and how can we get down there quicker, All right? So this is, a, this is a swift carb end mill and what you're going to see is that we're going to helical plunge at a 15 degree angle. So hopefully it's, uh, hopefully this plays well for you. Let's check this out. Yeah, it's a little choppy on our end, Adam, but I can I can see exactly kind of what you're talking about. 
So you see that video there, that is, that's in aluminum obviously, but every 360 degrees, we're actually plunging a quarter inch in that material. Okay, so there's different ways that we have, um, you know, inside of our adaptive clearing of how to get to depth. So we can, you know, we can ramp mill it, we can pre-drill the hole, and that way we just plunge the tool right in the bottom and start cutting, or we do what's called a tapered helix. Okay, and that's a technology we developed, and we'll talk about that uh, here in a little bit. But again, here's our setup parameters. You know, here's a here's a great example of another way you can go through. Uh, you know, straight line test cutting. It's just maybe go around a block and, and start machining in a square, right? And then once we take that data, we plug it in, and it starts creating our tool path for us. Now this application here, and if you guys are using our Express version, um, you get the 2.5D for free, okay? And other CAM companies will charge for the technology, and we actually just give it away for free. But here it is showing it in a 3D application, okay? And again, we want to cut as deep as we can we want to remove the material as fast as we can because we, we're gonna, we know we're going to spend more time finishing the part, so we just cut as deep as we can. And as it's reducing, uh, you can see here it's reducing its own steps because we want to leave a constant scallop or a constant cusp finish uh, when we come in here to start finishing the part. So again, if that's, uh, let's say, uh, you know, a one-inch end mill, I may machine, you know, one inch deep and then come back and do maybe 50,000 or 100,000 steps up to get that three-dimensional form on my part after the 3D finishing. Um, here's another example of um, some technology. I mean, you, you see all these retract moves, and you might think, wow, that, that looks really bad. But the way the technology calculates is, say, how do we get from one cut to the next? And what's the fastest way to get there? Right? And sometimes in some machines, you know, you want to go to rapid, you know, the clearance plane, and you want to wrap it to the next cut and plunge straight down. And sometimes it makes more sense if you've got newer machines because you can high feed rate faster than the rapid can. Right? And so I want to just keep my tool at depth, and I just want to wrap it to the next cut. You know, this here, you know, you, you look at this and it, you know, wow, it looks like a sewing machine. You know, you always see your, your, your spindle head just moving up and down and up and down. And you're like, wow, you know, what am I? Why is it doing that? Well, there's technology in here um, where you can keep your tool path down, right? So if you don't always want to go to clearance plane, Wayne will show you there's a drop-down tab inside the adaptive clearing that just says, you know, keep my tool at depth. And instead of going to clearance plane, it's going to stay down and do a high feed rate of the machine. You know, some machines out there, like Haas machines, can, can high feed rate at 600, 800 inches a minute, okay? The other thing is, majority of these cuts are going to be uh, in a G1, G2, or G3, right? So uh, if I go to rapid plane, right, it's going to go to, to G0. Well, if I only have my rapid set to 5%, you know, that thing is going to move like a snail trying to get to the next cut. Well, here I can just, you know, I have no, I don't worry about what my rapid's on in the bottom right-hand picture because it's going to go as fast as it can and it's going to get there. Now, the great thing about that is when I move from one cut to the next, if I'm staying at depth, we have this thing called a micro lift. And what it does is it actually lifts up off, it lifts your tool up off the floor, 40, you know, 50 thousandths, and, it, and you can designate that as well in the technology to say, you know, I don't want it to stay at depth and high feed rate. I want it to just, I want it to move up just a little bit because I don't want it to scratch my material or maybe there's some leftover chips. Um, on that floor, and I don't want it to, to, to nick that um, as it's doing a high feed rate. So you can actually tell it to lift up off the floor a little bit. Okay, and here comes one of the biggest problems we find now is, man, we're moving so much material so fast that we now have a problem with chip evacuation. Okay, so there's a couple ways to, to get around this. You know, let's, let's flood coolant. Uh, a lot of these end mill companies now do through the spindle coolant on their end mills. Um, you know, use bullnose cutters, you use air blast, um, even a horizontal machining center. This is a great scenario of, of you know, how adaptive clearing would be very beneficial in a horizontal machine because all your chips are just going to fall right out of the pocket instead of on a vertical, they're just going to stay in there. Um, and so, you know, this is probably, this is where you need to put a lot of emphasis on this as well. You know, you, recutting chips is a very big issue uh, when you're running adaptive clearing. 
And so the one thing that that we've developed in this technology uh, is called uh, a tapered helical entry. Okay, and what that does is, and this is a, a parameter Wayne will show you inside the technology and inside adaptive clearing as well. Um, but you can designate a taper angle, and it'll automatically do the calculations for you. You know, I'm going to do a, a helical plunge. It does. This is my you know major you know my major circle uh, for my circular plunge, and then it, uh, maybe I want to do a three or a five degree taper plunge. Okay. Now, what it's going to do is as it starts machining, it's going to reduce that uh, helical plunge smaller and smaller and smaller. And what that does is it gives you better chip evacuation. So as your tool is going down, chips evacuate. You're also not, re you're not also, uh, you know, work hardening the material. Because your tool is, if you're doing a standard helical plunge, your tool is going to keep rubbing on those walls as it goes down. But if you taper it, Right, you're only cutting where the tip of the tool and whatever your pitch is on that helical plunge, and you know this is we found that this is very effective and, and an official tool um, to help with recutting chips because this is majority of the time when we're recutting. You know, and if you're using a a bull nose or a standard end mill, man, and you, you and you lose that tip on that helical plunge, the second it gets down to depth and you start machining at 200 inches a minute, you're going to blow that tool up. So. Chip evacuation, big issue, um, but this will help you getting to full depth. So I got another video here. I'm, I'm just going to skip over it, but it's a great video that uh, our product manager, Al Watmu, has done at Pier 9. Um, you know, we talked about the spike tool holder. It's a great technology for us to, you know, make sure that we're developing this constant cutter engagement technology correct. Because you know maybe we are over engaging, or maybe we're not staying, you know, keeping our tool constantly engaged as, as much as we thought we were. So we have this spike tool holder that basically sends feedback to a PC while we're machining, and it can tell me if I'm over engaging my tool and how how long I'm staying constantly engaged in the material. So great technology, um, you know. With this, you know, we're seeing people reduce cycle times by 40, 50 percent. Um, you know, with, with HSM and, and different machines, you're going to get, uh, you know, better results. I, I, I'll tell you a couple of stories. I worked with a guy um, on this technology, and I said, hey, you know, he's like, I'm really interested in adaptive clearing. I don't know where to get started. I'm like, great. Let me, I'm going to come to your facility, and let's do some tests, right? So we show up, and I'm like, all right, what do you got? And he's like, well, we're going to machine titanium. I'm like, oh, this is great. Like, I love, I love a good challenge. Right? I'm like, cool, what kind of machine do you have? And he's like, well, you know, we got this really old mill. You know, it's probably 30 years old. It's been in production for so long. The issue is we can't run our spindle over 3,000 RPMs or it starts smoking. I'm like, well, okay, this is great, you know. Uh, all right, well, everything I've done in the past, eh, i got to start all over. So here's what we do. We threw a piece of titanium in his vise. You know, put a holder together. We put it in a uh, in a, an Albrecht hydraulic chuck, uh, and started test cutting. Right, and said, all right, we know our our first limit is the RPMs. We can't go over anything over 3,000 RPMs. So we set that variable. Start doing test cuts. And man, we reduced his cycle time from what used to take 20 minutes down to five minutes with adaptive clearing. So, great technology. Um, you know, we've got a lot of good videos on, on YouTube. You're going to see a lot of good videos in this presentation that talk about how to get your speeds and feeds. There's a lot of good calculators out there as well. Talk to your tooling vendors. They love a good challenge. They love to, you know, help you achieve better productivity, you know, uh, reduce cycle times. Um, so, you know, this is the... You know, and then that first question we asked you, you know, have you ever used this technology? And I did, you know, and the reason I put the second answer in there is it, is it is scary, right? So if you've ever seen someone run this, we've run aluminum at four or 500 inches a minute, you know, with a half inch end mill, one inch deep, inch and a half deep, right? It, you know, there's a little pucker factor when you start, when you start getting into this and, and, and getting accustomed to the high of high speeds and feeds that you're going to be running. So, you know, work your way up, do the straight line test cuts, prove it to yourself, right? And that's a great way to get accustomed to this technology. So if you, you know, you're not going to try it out on a, on a part and just say, hey, let's just wing it and hope these speeds and feeds work. Now, the biggest thing is when you calculate 
your straight line test cut speeds and feeds, make sure you run it at that feed and speed. Right? You can't just say, all right, I'm going to keep my RPMs at 100%, but I'm going to back my feed rate down to like 30% just to get started because I want to make sure it gets cutting. Well, now you've changed that whole machining scenario. That chip thinning that you calculated is now different than what you've tested. Right? So when you're running it, 100% feed, 100% speed, and let it go. Right? So this technology... 100% free in our tech in our in our software. If you're using Express, give it a shot. Um, if you're using the 3D application, it's great even for 2D applications. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Wayne now. And what we're going to do is we're going to have give we're going to have Wayne show you a quick demonstration of the product uh, of adaptive clearing. And if any of you have been using um, if any of you have been using you know HSM for standard roughing. The great thing that you're going to see Wayne show you is the dialog box and, and the way to, to create this adaptive clearing toolpath is the same process. Right? There's really no difference in it. The dialog box looks the same. The way you select the geometry is the same. It's just a different algorithm that calculates the type of toolpath in the background. So we're going to pass it over to Wayne now uh, and we'll have him give you a, a, a quick demonstration. Thanks, Adam. Um, that's an awesome description of, uh, of adaptive clearing. And I, I know we were talking a little while ago, you had mentioned um, how you've been working with some of the tool manufacturers, especially when it came to the chip evacuation and using that tapered helix plunge um, and how they're, they're working with the tools and looking at a real uh, benefit that we have with using that with uh, adaptive clearing uh, technology. Yeah, and that's and that's a great point, Wayne. You know, I was just with a couple of tooling vendors last week, and uh, and um, you know, they they're like, "Wow, we've never thought about doing something like that." You know, when I showed them our tapered helical plunge, they're like, "Wow, that makes a lot of sense, right?" That will really help us. You know, that is our biggest challenge: is how do we get to such great depths without recutting chips and breaking the tool? And then when they see the rest of the technology behind it, they're like, "Wow, this is you know." Wow, this is great. We, you know, we want to do some testing with you, and so we do a lot of that. We do a lot of testing at Pier Nine with a lot of tooling vendors out there to help them build their tools a little better. You know, get the depths faster. You know, uh, you know, different helixes, different pitches on their and end mills. Um, so it's a great technology that our industry is really trying to adapt to. And sorry to bogart the presentation again, but I, I, this is um, it's very hard to take this technology implement it into your facility because it is very scary, right? It's not something that you're used to, but I guarantee, try it, test cut, you'll be amazed at how well your machines can, can take this technology on. Well, let's see it. I'm ready. Awesome. Yeah, I remember I was out at uh, Pier 9 and I was able to work with some of the EEs while they're doing some testing. It's just really awesome work to do it out there. Okay. So if you guys can see my screen, I have the blue and green swirly up there. I have the Autodesk logo. I'm going to bring up Inventor with my Inventor HSM. There we go. So I have a, a familiar part that we work with. I'm going to walk through with you real quick on setting up some of those adaptive clearing toolpaths and also showing you how easy it is to use this interface when we work through and, uh, and, and how integrated our CAD and our CAM are working together. So this is a part, um, I have a hole usually in this part. I took it out just so you could see a little bit better when we work through adaptive. So any of you who are new to working with our HSM, our HSM is a plugin, as Adam had mentioned. We have it for our SolidWorks interface, which is HSM Works. We have it for Inventor, which is Inventor HSM. We also have it inside of our Fusion product. It comes with Fusion as part of the CAM, but it's the same engine that works behind them. So when you plug it into Inventor, you get a CAM tab that's just like the, the ribbon bar that you normally have to work with your assemblies and your parts. So we get a CAM tab. We also get the browser. We add in a CAM browser. So now as we work, we can see a history of the toolpaths that we work on our parts. And working through, uh, we have that same in-context help as well. When you hover over, you'll be able to find that help. And F1 will bring you to our Autodesk Knowledge Network, will help you even more to learn about those different uh, aspects of HSM. So I'm going to add some toolpaths. Right now I have some on here just to show you some of the comparison. 
of some of the tool paths that Adam was talking about. So I have a face. Uh, this is the adaptive clearing. Looking at that constant engagement, looking at the chip load you'd find as it works its way down into the material. I just want to show you real quick, and then we're going to walk through how to set them up. Uh, this is a traditional pocket toolpath, as also similar to what Adam was showing you. The tool is going to be engaged, that engagement angle, the tool engagement angle is going to be huge when it goes into the part. If you're going into your stock like this, it's really going to put a lot of wear and tear on your tool. Looking at it with the adaptive, looks like it will give you more moves and a lot of more step downs, or shall I say lift ups or, or lift offs. In here, um, you're going to have a much more efficient toolpath using as much of that engagement angle as possible. Uh, another thing I want to show you as you're working through the toolpath, and I'll show you this, but when we look at that dialog, as Adam had mentioned, uh, the workflow I love using in CAM is always the same. It's always the same workflow, working from left to right, top down. As I look in a traditional pocket toolpath, I can see where I'm working with my passes, my linking parameters. If I look at that compared to the adaptive clearing toolpath, it's exactly the same workflow you quickly and easily can find out where each of those uh, the uh, parameters that you need to change to engage with the material. So I'd like to walk through real quick and set these up. I'm going to go really fast just to show you how easy it is to go through the software on setting up your adaptive. We're going to touch on some of those points that Adam had pointed out as well. So I'm going to do a brand new setup on this part. So I'm going to go up to setup. Okay, I'm going to make a new setup, give it a second. It recognizes the entire assembly. It's set up that it thinks it's going to do a turning toolpath because of my, my template's set up that way. I'm going to, I can either choose turning or mill. I'm going to change it to mill. I'm going to select the part that I want to cut, which is this part right here. I can change where I want my, my G0, my G54. I can set the orientation. I'm going to change that G54 to be right on the corner of the stock up there. So quickly I can set up my orientation and how I want the part set up to be able to machine it. So that's going to be where I'm going to touch off with my probe. And now I want to set up the stock size. So I'm going to add an eighth inch around the part. I'm going to add a tenth on the top to trim off with a face melt. As I do this, notice that you can see right in the graphics view, as I make a change in the field right inside of the cam uh, setup, you see a change right in the graphics view as I make the changes. Really in integrated, really good integration. So that's my setup. I say OK, in just a couple clicks I have a setup, and I'm able to do those tool paths that we talked about. Real quick, I want to face off that tenth off the top of the part. So I'm going to go up to my face tool path. Again, that same workflow. It brought in a tool that I was last working with. So the first thing I do working from left to right is pick a tool. So I'm going to go into my tool library. HSM comes with a really good library full of different tools that you can use right outside of the, uh, of the sample tools. I suggest creating a library that matches the tools that you're working with because this is what's going to drive your speeds and feeds is in the tool library. So you set up your tool according to the manufacturer. So I suggest creating a library, like in this case I have my aluminum tools that I set up in my Haas VF machine to set each of these tools that have the speeds and feeds and the geometry that matches the tool uh, for aluminum. You can also set one up for your steels, your plastic tools, or even for your machine. In this case, I have some tools that I had set up for this template that I use, so I'm going to use those tools. I have a face mill that I like working with. This is the one Mara tool that I set up in my machine. I select it, it brings it right into my graphics view, so I can see what the tool is going to look like. And then I'm going to leave it everything else out of the box because of face toolpath, I don't have to pick any geometry because when I did the setup, it recognized automatically where the part is according to the stock. So I'm going to say OK. Quickly calculates and I get a face toolpath and it's stepping down because I had my parameters st set up that it knows that I want to step down 50 thousandths into the part. I can simulate it real quick. And I want to see what that's going to look like with the stock turned on. So I can actually see, I'll speed it up a little bit. Actually, I speed it up a lot. But I can actually go and rewind this. I can set it back where it was, play it, speed it up right through. So it's a real easy interface to see what your toolpath is going to look like before you move on to the next step. Okay, now let's get into the adaptive. Um, so we were looking into, uh, Adam was telling us a lot about how the adaptive is really going to help you save a lot of time. Uh, it's going to help you become more efficient in your tool pass, um, and you're going to be able to get really nice uh, roughing strategies with the adaptive. So I'm going to go up to 2D adaptive clearing. Um, it remembered the last tool, plus I have that same workflow. 
the same exact workflow from the face tool path. Real easy to use and find my way. First thing, working from left to right, I'm going to select the tool. I'm going to be roughing it, so I'm going to use a roughing tool that I had set up with the three flute roughing tool. Select it, brings it into my graphics view. It also brought in the feeds and speeds I'm going to use for that tool. Okay, the next step would be selecting the geometry. It's automatically set up for pocket selection because it wants to know what boundary area. Very like a traditional pocket type toolpath. So in here, I'm just going to simply select the edge. I can also select the pocket itself. I can select that edge that gives me a boundary, the blue area where the tool is going to stay. That's where I want the chips to be cleaned. That's where my roughing is going to start. In the same way, I can get these open pockets. Now, if I select the floor, it's going to give me the whole thing. But if I select an edge, it gives me the open pocket, and it recognizes where the edge of the stock is, so it knows where the tool pass should stop or start and, and step in. The same thing for the outside or for the other side. Now, those are the open pockets, and I have another closed pocket right here. So simply selecting right off the model, it doesn't matter if they're different heights. It'll give me that tool path according to where the geometry is. So just selecting right off the model, I don't have to create any geometry. It's right there in the model, completely integrated there. I'm going to show you the heights in a minute, but in the passes, as Adam had mentioned, this is our optimal load. So this is what's going to drive that calculation for the tool engagement angle. This is what's going to set up your speeds and feeds in the tool path to be able to get that optimal uh, engagement. I'm going to keep the radial engagement with the tool or with the material as much of that flute length as possible. You can set this. You can just type in how much of that optimal load you want to have in the material. This would come from information from your tool uh, manufacturer as what your optimal load would be. But also, as Adam had mentioned, it's a pretty good idea to do some testing, find out. Your machine may be different than most machines. You, you might have a different stick out on your tool. You might be engaging a harder material than, than you might uh, have set up. So it might be a good, it's really a good idea to do some testing on your own and find out what that optimal load, find out what speeds and feeds will work for you and your machine and the material you're trying to cut. But if you need to change that optimal load, I just want to show you a quick uh, tip and trick. If you right click in any of the fields, especially in this optimal load field, and you go down to edit expression, you can see the expression that's driving that optimal load to feed into the calculation for the, uh, the constant tip angle that you're going to work with for the engagement angle. Here it's coming from the tool diameter, the tool that I selected from a library, and it's multiplying it by a factor. In this case, I could change that factor of, let's say, 35 of the tool diameter, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, it's a factor of it because it's gonna calculate into that average. I'm gonna say, okay, recalculates, and now I have my new optimal load that's gonna drive the engagement. So that's easy way to set it up. Just to let you know, you also set your stock to leave in here. So you can tell it how much you wanna leave on when you come back on the walls or on the uh, floors that you're gonna clean up with a finishing operation. Um, we're gonna show you the linking in a minute. I'm gonna say, okay. It calculates, and it gives us that adaptive clearing. Here you see it's going straight down. It's going to helix down into the material so you can use as much of that flute length as, tool, as, as possible of the tool as possible as you're engaging the material. And as it reaches the bottom, it's going to helix its way out. And as it helixes, just like Adam was showing you in a diagram, when it reaches the pocket in an area where it can't keep that same constant chip load, it lifts off the material. It lifts out backs out and comes in for another bite and engages at the exact same chip, chip size. You'll get the same load, the same size chip coming out, and it's going to give you a much more efficient tool path, and you're using as much of that flute length as possible. So it backs out again, comes back in for another bite. It's going to reduce any burial because it's keeping that same, si same angle, the same engagement angle, the same size chip the entire time until it reaches a point where it's just going to take a little chip out. Really efficient, really good toolpath. The same thing here for the open pocket. It's going to work its way from the open edge of the stock and work its way into the material, keeping that same engagement the entire time. Really efficient. Now, one thing that Adam had talked about was this is going to helix straight down. Now, getting down to that depth might really cause some problems with the tool. You're recutting chips, you're work hardening the material. So as you're working your way down there, you're, you're really not helping your tool out. So to add some clearance, and this is what Adam was talking about, was that tapered uh, plunge angle or the tapered helix 
uh, plunge or tapered helix entry into the material, if we have a tapered uh, uh, helix in here, we're going to each, with each pass, we're going to leave room for those chips to be pulled out. So what I want to do is I want to add that taper in here, and I do it this way. If I right-click on the adaptive, go to Edit, again, real easy to see the interface, I'm going to go into my, my linking parameters. Down here in linking, we're going to talk about this a little bit, but down here in linking, in my ramp, this is where we set the helix. We're doing a helix into the material, and what I want to do is I want to set up this ramp taper angle right here. This is going to give me that angle um, that when the, tool, when the tool is going down to depth, it's going to leave uh, with each helix some room for the chips to evacuate. You can decide what that angle is, and I'm going to put it in about 5 degrees. I'm going to say OK. It recalculates quickly, and now I have that tapered angle going down. So as I, as I look at this, let's go up here. I'm going to simulate. We're going to simulate the, uh, I'll do it by operation so you can see it a little bit better. So as we simulate, I'm going to simulate this toolpath. There's the uh, there's the, the 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 finishing on top or the uh, facing, and I'm going to fast forward so we can see it going into the pocket. But this is doing that constant chip load, the constant engagement. Here it's working its way out of the pocket. I kind of fast forwarded past, so I'm going to back it up. I want to see that helix into the engagement, so I'm going to back up my simulation to that step where it starts to enter and it recalculates real quickly really good simulation engine. So let's take a look. As it helix down, it's a little bit above the material, so I know I'm going to change where my top is. And that's easy to easily done in the heights, so I'm not cutting a whole bunch of air. But I just want to show you, as it engages the material, it's keeping that constant chip load. I also might want to change my diameter, too, because I don't want to end up with that little pin in the middle that's going to shoot out. But I can wear that down. But I can also change what that angle is. But as you see it going down into the material, we're leaving room for chip evacuation. So for each helical uh, um, um, cycle, or each time it goes around the helix, it leaves that room. I'm going to back up a little bit. It's leaving room, show you again, for those chips to evacuate. It's going to save you a lot of that tool life. And when it finally gets down to the bottom and works its way out, you're keeping that same angle. You're keeping the same engagement angle, the same size chip being pulled out of there. You can run at higher feeds and speeds now keeping it really efficient, getting that part done, and getting it off the machine a lot quicker. There it is doing the helix. Again, a couple adjustments. It's going to keep you from recutting those chips when you get down to the bottom. And here it's doing the walls and doing that constant step over. Or shall I say, the constant chip size, keeping that same angle, engagement angle the entire time. So that's doing the roughing of the pockets. I really quickly, I want to take that same algorithm. I like the way it was set up. I like the way it, it keeps that same engagement. I want to use that to cut from the outside of the part in. I want to cut all this geometry into the part. So I'm going to go and copy that same adaptive. Copy. I'm going to right click in, this, in, the, in the browser here and paste. And I can make a duplicate of that same toolpath. And now I want to be able to cut from the outside in, so I right-click, go to Edit. Okay, I'm going to go into my geometry. I don't want those three pockets anymore. I want to cut to the, to the profile of the part. And now it recognizes where the edge of the stock is, and that blue area is where I'm going to remove the chips. So quickly I can apply the same settings I did on the, on the adaptive for the pockets. Now I'm using the same settings for the adaptive and the same tool uh, for the adaptive on the outside in. Okay, the heights. Now, if I want to be able to get that, it's going to cut right where I selected the bottom of the contour. I'd like it to cut as close to the soft jaw as possible without hitting it. So for my heights, I'm going to change them. Real easy to work with. They're all color coded. They're all color coordinated. I can see where the clearance, the retract, the top height is, and also my bottom. So if I change this to select the soft jaw, you see that blue it moved down, and it moved down to where the top of the soft jaw is, so I can see clearly where the bottom of the tool is going to be. Now, I don't want it to, the bottom of the tool to scrape on my soft jaw, so I'm going to add an offset of 50 thousandths. That raises it up off the soft jaw, 50 thousandths above. Now I can control where the bottom of the tool is going to be really quickly and easily just by clicking it and adding an offset. So in my passes, they're set pretty well. I'm going to leave my stock the same optimal load I had set up. I'm going to say OK. 
and it calculates and gives me this adaptive. As Adam had said, you see a lot of these little lifts, lift-offs here. It's, in this case, it's lifting off because it's trying to calculate where it can get the, mo the uh, algorithm can get the most bang for its buck. Um, he had mentioned we do have an option in here that you can change how much that tool is lifted off the material. If we right-click on that toolpath, go to Edit, if I go to my linking parameters, right here we can tell it how much to stay down in the material. We can choose, we want to stay down least, so when it calculates, and it looks like, it looks at the areas, it calculates the areas where it can remove the most material uh, most efficiently, we can say stay in one area or jump around the part where it sees most material. In this case, I'm going to say stay down the most. Okay, and also that lift height that Adam had mentioned here. How far do you want to lift off while we're already in the material to come back for another bite? Um, this is that micro lift that Adam had mentioned. Okay, and we could change that, and you can also do that according to an expression as well. Okay, so I'm going to say OK. It recalculates really quickly, and now if you look, that material, that tool is staying down as much as possible in the material as it as works its way from the outside in, and you see it has very few retracts now. It's doing that micro lift when it comes back for a bite, but it's staying in that general area of the part. It's still doing that very uh, efficient adaptive clearing. We're just not moving back and forth throughout the part. So let's take a look. I'm going to go to Setup, Simulate. We're going to simulate. I'll fast forward through some of the ones we've looked at already. And here it's going to come in and work its way from the outside of the part using as much of that flute length as possible. Right? Just like Adam said, you have all that flute length. You paid for it. Use all that tool as much as possible. Okay, And you're going to control that. You're going to keep that tool able to run faster and more efficient by keeping a constant chip load, keeping that same angle, the same engagement angle the entire time. That's really going to let you run it faster, higher feeds and speeds, and more efficiently. Okay, Real easy to set these tool paths up. Okay, I'm going to close out of there. So there's our adaptives. Just to show you the, the, what the difference would be with the traditional, I'm going to use a traditional pocket to clean them up. And I'll show you a quick tip. If I want to be able to set up a quick pocket, I can say 2D pocket. And I can select a 2D pocket, and it'll bring me into the same interface. Now, I could do that, but then I have to select the, all the other stuff. I have to select the geometry and the heights and all that information. What I can do is this. I already set up the geometry, I have a tool, I have other information If I that it's driving my, my uh, roughing. If I right click, I'm going to go down to create derived operation and I'm going to choose 2D milling and do a 2D pocket. What that'll do, it'll copy all the pertinent information as well as the properties from the adaptive clearing into this pocket toolpath that I can use for finishing. So again, working from left to right, that great easy to use interface, I'm going to pick a tool. I'm not going to use my roughing tool, my three flute. What I do want to use is my five flute finishing tool. I select it, brings the tool in, updates my speeds, my feeds and speeds. If I go to the geometry, it's already selected because it copied it from the adaptive. My heights, I don't have to change them. Passes, it, it's set up. It doesn't give me the same optimal load only because we're not doing the, uh, the adaptive roughing. I can tell it what the step over is. This is the traditional type of step over. So again, I can control that by an expression, or I can put in here and I say, I want um, an eighth of an inch step over. Oops, an eighth of an inch. I want an eighth of an inch step over, okay, and I don't want to leave any stock. I'm going to say OK, calculates. And you see, it gives me that it gives me that step over. I'm engaging the material just like the traditional pocket, using it as a finishing. But here, I'm helixing into material that's not even there. So it thinks I'm still doing a sort of a roughing operation. So if I right click, go to edit, in my linking parameters, I can change that from doing a helix to a plunge. It's going to work its way down to about a tenth because I can set this a tenth above the stock that I left in the pocket. Okay, I'm going to say OK, recalculates, and now I have it going down. So I'm also going to do a quick finishing operation for the outside. So I'm going to right-click on the adaptive I used to, to rough the outside, right-click, create derived operation, and I'm going to do a 2D contour to clear from the outside in. Again, just to show you the same workflow that we saw in the adaptive, we can do it here in the contour. Okay, so I'm going to, again, working from left to right, I'm going to select the tool as my finishing tool. 
I'm going to choose the geometry. I don't have to. It's already set. The height's already set because I did a derived operation. Passes, I can choose. Now, right now, stock to leave isn't on. And I can choose if I want to have multiple finishing passes and if I want to have a different feed rate for any of those finishing passes. I can do that. Linking parameters, I can set those the same way. So it's really the same workflow. Real easy to find my way around and make changes. And there I have my finishing step. So I can take a look at them. I highlight setup two, simulate. We could take a look at that. Again, I could fast forward to the different operations we've seen already. And there it's going to come in and there's my pocket, kind of cutting some air there. So I might want to come back in and take a look at how that's approaching. But it's not too bad. It looks like it's doing that traditional step over. I probably really wouldn't want to rough with that. It's going to put a lot of, lot of stress on that tool, a lot of uh, strain on there. And, uh, and you're going to get that tool worn out quicker, quicker if I was going to do a roughing with that. But doing finishing, you can see, it's not going to engage that much of the, of the uh, tool. So therefore, we're not getting those, those load spikes that you find in, in this type of toolpath if you're doing roughing. Okay, so there's the cleanup of the pockets. And then we have another one, a cleanup of the outside of the part. So I can easily see what that's going to look like right here in simulation. If I had any crashes or clashes with the stock or the part, it would light up red and show me, and it would give me a warning that I have to go back and change my toolpath. So I can see simulation right there on the part itself, completely integrated right inside of Inventor. Close that out. Again, easy to use interface. I'm able to find my way in here and make changes to my adaptive, being able to walk through. Selecting geometry was easy. Setting my passes, looking at the optimal load. Okay, I can change that manually, use an expression to change it or drive it that matches my tool manufacturer's recommended, or the, the optimal loads that I had figured out by running the tool in the material and doing test cuts and finding out what works best with that tool and that material. Okay, save that information. You can get that to your tool library. Create tool libraries that match the tools in your machine, and you're, you're going to start building more efficient tools using this, in, uh, this uh, interface uh, for CAD CAM. So, again, complete integration. Easy to use. We're able to set up those tool paths, especially the adaptive, being able to do that helix, being able to do the tapered helix to get into the part, saving you a lot of tool life, able to run as much of that flute length as possible. Just as Adam had mentioned, this is a great way to, uh, to have efficient tool paths, increase those feeds and speeds, uh, and be able to get those parts off the machine a lot quicker. All right, guys, that's what I had planned to show. It looks like we're right at the top of the hour. Um, Jordan, I'd like to hand it back over to you. Uh, and, uh, and Adam, thank you very much. For thank you. Hey, Wayne, thanks so much. That you was it, incredible guys. information. Um, you know, look, we do these things every week, and I just want to make sure that we're constantly providing value. Adam, any closing thoughts as we wrap up this week's HSM Hangout? No, I, you know, I appreciate everyone coming and, you know, really appreciate all the feedback. You know, I, one, of the, one of the last comments in the uh, question area is, is um, you know, I just wanted to mention how great adaptive clearing also worked with live tooling on a mill turn machine, you know. And, and so, th you know, we want to make sure that when we, you know, present these webinars that, you know, we, we want to make sure that we, we're getting you the right information. So feedback about these webinars, you know, highly um, you know, highly beneficial for us, our technology. You know, without without getting feedback from you of how our technology works, how HSM works, you know, we re need to rename a button or maybe when you click this button your car starts, you know, I don't know. But without you telling us that information, right, we want to make the product better for you guys. So please, we love the feedback. Um, please give us all you could. Uh, I and on the technology, on our webinar series, we want to make sure that we're highlighting specific technology that you guys want to learn more about. Awesome, awesome. Thanks, Adam. Uh, guys, a couple of quick announcements. I want, I want to let everybody know that this year at um, IMTS, Autodesk is going to have a huge presence. For those of you that don't know, uh, a couple of years ago we made an acquisition. Uh, we bought a company called Dellcam. So today, when you look at the uh, portfolio of products that Autodesk is bringing to market, whether you're interested in working in the cloud or whether you're interested in working inside of SolidWorks or Inventor, uh, you know, 
you can go to Chicago this year in September and you can interact with Adam. He'll be there. Wayne will be there. You can meet him in person. Um, you can see all the incredible technology that Autodesk is bringing to market in addition to uh, some of the tooling vendors that Adam talked about that he's working with as well. So thank you so much. Next week, guys, we've got a really great presentation for everybody. We're going to expand on the Don't Fear 5 Axis. Um, so please shoot over, shoot over any questions you might have, and we'll get those addressed. And have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you so much. Oh, hold on one second, Wayne. Um, I almost forgot. We didn't tell any, everybody about the uh, Autodesk Knowledge Network, the CAM forum. Uh, can you bring that up real quick just so we can let everybody know? Absolutely. Um, so uh, we have our forum. Uh, I'm going to bring up the Autodesk. All you do is uh, search um, Knowledge Network, Autodesk Knowledge Network, uh, and you find it. There's a lot of information in here. You can quickly search if you're working in HSM, you're working in different uh, interfaces. Uh, if you're looking for um, uh, HSM works or even uh, Inventor HSM, you can find a lot of information right inside of uh, our, uh, um, let's say we're looking for Inventor products and I want to look for CAM or HSM. Uh, our Autodesk Knowledge Network is a plethora of information to get you started. Uh, a lot of the information that Adam had even talked about today, you can find in here. Uh, setting up the tool pass in, the, in a great way. Uh, I'm going to look up HSM there as well. Uh, we have our forum uh, that you can look up, again, videos that connect you to our Autodesk uh, CAM website as well. A lot of tutorials, places you can find help if you're getting stuck. A great resource is our Autodesk Knowledge Network. Uh, also, our forum. So if you look up our Autodesk CAM and on our main site, so you look in our CAM Solutions site, you'll find a lot of connections for our forum. If you're learning, uh, connect to our forum here. Uh, Autodesk, this is our inventor site, but you can also see it's going to have all of our CAM to work with. So it'll bring you into a place where you can look in our forum, uh, work with post support, a great forum to find answers. Uh, if you have some answers and you want to put some up there and give some comments, uh, even we also have a place where you can look into development updates. Um, even HSM ideas, Adam had mentioned, if there's places where, as you're working with the software, we're always looking to improve it. We're always looking to put those tools in that will really help you uh, to be able to get those tool pass and work with our interface. Um, you can enter your HSM ideas into the idea station. So our forum is a great place to go to enter your information uh, to help us make our software better, as well as find answers as you're trying to work your way uh, through the interface and work with really good tool paths. So this is another place that you can go to. Um, we also have a post library. I just want to mention this because a lot of people ask following our webinars. Um, we also have a site. I'm just going to go here. It's our Autodesk post library. Um, Cam.autodesk.post is a great place to take a look because it's updated daily. You can look on here. You could do a search. We have a lot of Haas posts in here. Um, and these are generic posts. Most of them, well, I should say, all the Haas ones that I've worked with have worked really well out of the box. Um, and you can also do a search for your machine and your type of machine. If you're doing turning or if you're doing mill turn, you can look on this, autodesk.com post or cam.autodesk.com post, and see if you could find your post in here. You could download it directly. You can also see some history when it was updated. So that's another great resource. So take advantage of our Autodesk Knowledge Network. Do some search in there to find some answers. Uh, we also have a, a, a huge uh, following in uh, YouTube with a lot of our videos and a lot of our training. You can find us our channel on YouTube. Uh, work with our Inventor uh, Forum. Our, our, it's not Inventor, it's our HSM Forum. We also have a forum for uh, if you're working with CAM through Fusion. We also have a forum there as well. And also find your post online. So there's a lot more information, but these are some of the key things we like to make sure that you go away from our webinars, knowing that you can find more information, more content. Thanks, Wayne. Hey, that's awesome. One last question for everybody before we let you go for the weekend. I hope you all have really great plans. I want to understand what's the likelihood of our, of our audience today of, uh, you know, are you guys ready? Is your company ready to, to get on this journey and reduce your programming and cycle times and improve your profit margins with the technology that we presented to you today? Um, so a few options for you. Let us know what you think. Only 22% of you guys have voted, so 
you know, we appreciate all of your votes. Oh, thank you. We've seen a big uptick now, 40%. Great. Let's get those votes counted. Um, this helps us understand how we can provide value and help improve your daily workflows. We, we love seeing it. So get these answers submitted, and I hope you all have a really great weekend. Join us next week, same place, same time, new content, and be sure to say hi when you're stopping by IMTS. Adam, where are we going to be uh, as far as the, uh, the show is located? Is it the East Hall, the North Hall? Yeah, we're in the East Hall. And what we'll do is we'll make sure we send everyone an invitation to come visit us in our booth with a booth number and a, and a map of exactly where our booth is located in the East Hall. Awesome. Thanks so much. So with that, we're closing the polls. Thank you for all of your results, everyone. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, guys. Have a great week.